The Lord Jesus clearly expects all believers to be fishers of men. That's what Jesus said to his first disciples in Matthew's gospel chapter 4 verse 19. Follow me, you fishermen, and I will make you fishers of men. Yet tragically, many Christians do not view themselves as being soul winners. Isn't that why we support missionaries? We give, they go. Others don't evangelize as they ought because they rarely go outside of their Christian bubble. There is certain certainly safety in the company of the righteous. But you remember that Jesus, when he prayed for his elect in John 17, made it very clear that I am not praying that the Father take the true believer out of the world, but that as we are in the world, that the Father would protect us. And that's why we say around here, we gather on the Lord's Day to worship and learn We scatter to witness and live. Others rarely witness because they have adopted practical pluralism. Practical pluralism, what's that? Deep down, some believers hope that there may in fact be many ways to God. Of course, this runs contra to the clear testimony of Scripture. Jesus himself said, not I am a way. He said, I am the way. And no one comes to the Father but through me. The Apostle Paul made it very clear that faith comes by hearing the word concerning Christ. The apostle said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation and no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Some do not witness faithfully because they have adopted hyper-Calvinist tendencies, forgetting that God's sovereignty and his electing grace in no ways mitigates biblical responsibilities and human culpability. All of us, if we're being honest, from time to time, are guilty of making excuses. As we work our way through the Gospel of John, it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit would awaken us from any and all evangelistic slumber. And who better to learn from than the evangelist par excellence and Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So we pick up the action then in this familiar account in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. Let's drop back down to verse 25 just to remind ourselves of the context for this morning's exposition of verses 31 through 38. The title of the message, fittingly, is No Excuses. As Jesus has this evangelistic discussion with this Samaritan Woman, she says to him in verse 25, she's beginning to see, Sir, I know that Messiah is coming. Verse 25, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The first big reveal in John 4, a truth that the entire world needs to know in order to believe and be saved, is that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. He is not just a prophet, verse 19, He is the prophet, the prophet that Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 18. In other words, he's telling this lady, the search is over. The Tahib, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one is here. He is the one who is speaking to you even now. 
This is a climatic moment in this unexpected discussion, this conversation, this evangelistic presentation between the master evangelist and this immoral lady who is at the well in the noontime heat. At the apex of this evangelistic encounter, the disciples in verse 27 unknowingly interrupt an unexpected ministry breakthrough. Like children, they seem to always butt in at the wrong time. And so we read on in verse 27, as Jesus has just made the big announcement, the big reveal, the search is over. The Messiah is here. And at this very point, his disciples came. And they marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? The disciples expect to find Jesus recharging his spiritual batteries. Verse 6 told us that Jesus was tired. Now, they had just traveled all the way to Samaria. And yet when they return to the place where they had left Jesus to rest, to refresh himself from some water from the well as they went off to collect lunch, they, they find themselves shocked that Jesus is, is not resting. Instead, he has his evangelistic fishing pole in a murky Samaritan pond. As I've mentioned before, this is the heart of God on display. This is God's agape love in action. And it brings us to our first of two sermon headings. I mentioned some of the excuses that people use today, knowing that when God saves us, he then sets us apart and calls all of us to join in the proclamation of the gospel near and far. Some he sends to far places as missionaries. To all of us, he, he sends us out, giving us different talents, placing us in different neighborhoods with different socioeconomic backgrounds, giving us access to different corners, even within the respective communities of which we live, calling all of us to this mission. We know what we ought to do, but we often find ourselves not doing it. We find ourselves, like the disciples here in this passage, making excuses. I want you to notice, first of all, that in verses 31 to 38, this passage illustrates three excuses for evangelistic negligence. Three excuses for evangelistic negligence. I think we need to realize that when we study the Gospels, uh, we're seeking to find out, uh, to deepen our knowledge of who Jesus is and why he matters. Uh, To, by the grace of God as believers, to strive to to walk as, as he walked. But though we desire to be like the central character of the Gospels, we need to read the Gospels honestly, faithfully, and humbly recognizing that we too often are actually more like the disciples than we are like Jesus. So it is true even in the arena of evangelism. So we have then the first evangelistic excuse that we see here illustrated in this passage. Let's refer to this as pride and prejudice. Pride and prejudice. Glance back down, if you would, at verse 27. Are you ever guilty of this? Of course, of course. At this point, verse 27, Jesus' disciples return and they marveled. He's not doing what they expected him to be doing, which was pretty much nothing. In his humanity, he was truly tired, weary, and thirsty. But what they marvel at initially is the fact that he seems to be doing ministry, interacting with a woman. A Samaritan at that. 
They were all thinking the same thing. Uh, their pride and their prejudice was like, oh, wait, oh, I don't get this. I thought we were going to try to make our way. The quickest route was through Samaria. The most normal route was to go around Samaria. The master said we had to go this way. We get in, we get out, we get on our way. And here's Jesus interacting with this Samaritan woman. They were all thinking the same thing, yet nobody dared say. Thankfully, John tells us what they were thinking. Verse 27, what do you seek? And, or why do you speak with her? The disciples are absolutely shocked to find the Savior ministering to this heterodox half-breed Samaritan woman. The Jews look down their noses at Samaritans. We've talked about the reasons why in previous messages. The disciples are basically thinking, you can write in the margins of your Bible, what they're thinking here is this. Why bother? Why bother? Friend, how many times do we manifest the same heart attitude. Why bother? Oh, you've not thought this recently? As you observe the people that God brings across your path? Why even bother seeking to have a relationship, hoping to have a platform to declare Christ to the town drunk? Or the party animal? or the sleazy harlot, or the Muslim immigrants, or that crazy uncle of ours. Oh, we wouldn't say it aloud, but we often think thoughts that we would be embarrassed if they were flashed on the screen behind me. Our pride and our prejudice, oh, these individuals like this, they're basically irredeemable. They'd never listen. Here it is. Why bother? Pride and sinful prejudice not only hampers romantic relationships, a la Jane Austen, it also hinders, more importantly, evangelistic opportunities, a la John chapter 4. Oh, that we would Look to Christ, learn from Christ, sit at his feet. Ask that the spirit of Christ that was the driving power within Christ, the one who led him and controlled him, guided him. Oh, that God would, would stir within the, the, the church, this church, these people, you, me, that, that these excuses would evaporate as faith is faith in this Christ compels us not only to entrust our souls to him in terms of our salvation, but also that we would then walk by faith in Christ as we seek to do ministry to the glory of God. Well, friends, as faithful followers of Christ, may we never lose sight. May we never lose sight of Luke chapter 5, verses 31 to 32, where Jesus said this, we counter thoughts that are unbiblical, that, though common, with the truth of Scripture. What was Jesus thinking? I'll tell you what he was thinking. He was thinking this, what he declares directly in Luke chapter 5, verses 31 to 32. Jesus said to them, listen, you won't understand my ministry. You won't understand my evangelism, my outreach, if you don't understand this. Luke 5, 31. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, I have not come to call the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. Where you find sinners, you have an opportunity and a need. The need is salvation. The solution is Christ. The opportunity is yours. What keeps us sometimes from going there? It's pride and prejudice. Eh, why even bother? 
We move now to the second excuse for evangelistic negligence illustrated in verses 31 to 34. Let's label this busyness and misplaced priorities. Busyness and misplaced priorities. The disciples who love Jesus want him to rest, refuel, and to get out of Dodge. It's Samaria. They had wished that they hadn't even had to go there. Have you ever ended up somewhere? You're like, man, I, I just want to get the gas in the car and get out of this place. Verse 31. In the meantime, the Samaritan lady goes. We, we picked up that narrative last week. The disciples return. She goes, her heart having been pierced to the revelation concerning Jesus, the gospel, now believing, eyes opened, testifying, confessing to her fellow Samaritans. She thinks this is who I found, but in reality, it was God who found her. But nonetheless, this action happens. And meanwhile, the disciples come as she's going, and they were requesting him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Hey, you sent us away. While you rested by Jacob's well, we've returned with the food that you asked us to go and purchase. Jesus seems to be thinking about something else now, not food and water. Teacher, would you just, just settle down? Just, just sit down, just rest, just eat this food. Jesus' initial response is somewhat cryptic, verse 32. But Jesus said to them, this is interesting, I have food to eat that you do not know about. <laughs> what? The disciples, therefore, were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? He was tired. He was a teacher. We're all tired. He's more tired. He's the one doing the lion's chair of the ministry at this point, preaching the gospel, performing miracles. So they go off into the city as Jesus had asked. Now they return with what Jesus asked for, and now he's saying, I'm okay. What's this about? This is confusing. Did, did, did somebody come and offer him food when we were away? Jesus clarifies what, he, what he's talking about in verse 34. Notice the text. You always know that you're listening to true preaching when you regularly hear, look to the text. The exposition is simply to give us the sense of the meaning of the text, and the preacher then is called by God to help us to understand some of its implications as the man of God is not only called to preach the word of God in season and out, but to reprove, rebuke, and to exhort with great patience and careful instruction. So look to the text. What does God want us to see here? What's Jesus talking about? I have food to eat that you don't even know about? So important. Jesus said to them, verse 34, this is what I'm talking about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Here's a reminder that the Father's top priorities consume God the Son. You might say that Jesus was a holy man on a holy mission. And you say, well, what fueled Jesus' mission? Notice the two main verbs in verse 34. Do and accomplish. 
My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What are some of the secrets to Jesus' ministry faithfulness? What are some of the things that can be duplicated if the people of God and the Spirit of God follow the Word of God as we look to Christ and to seek to walk as He walked? How did Jesus live His life? How did He make decisions as to what to do, how long to stay, where to go? Jesus possessed single-minded focus. This is particularly challenging and difficult to do in an age with so many distractions. Jesus had a single-minded focus. In other words, the priorities of heaven govern the earthly choices that Jesus made on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis. It's why important that we're regularly in the Word so we know these are what God's priorities are for our lives so that we can then make decisions by faith Guys, you don't understand. Listen, I have food, my real food. What really sustains me, and that which is even of greater importance is this. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. In other words, Jesus is the embodiment of Psalm 40, verse 8. You can write it down, read it later. Psalm 40, verse 8. The psalmist said this. I delight to do thy will, O my God, for thy law is within my heart. What consumed Jesus' mind when he got out of bed in the morning? Even when he was tired and hungry? He was even more consumed and more focused on the priorities of God for his life, on the mission that God had sent him to perform. May we ask ourselves this question here this morning. Am I a ministry-minded, spirit-led believer? Oh, but you don't know how busy I am. Oh, you don't realize that if uh, I don't have time to do that because of this and this and this and this. The second evangelistic, the second excuse for evangelistic negligence illustrated here in the disciples is busyness and misplaced priorities. And Jesus is going to try to set the record straight. There's something in this text that is illustrated by the the perfect life of our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that is so applicable for the hour in which we live and minister. Listen to this quote. This is one of those ones where I I read it. Uh, It knocked me on the floor, proverbially speaking. Then I got up and it knocked me down again. One pastor commenting on verses 31 to 34 wrote this. Be ready to say ouch rather than amen. By his example, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. By his example... Jesus, Rabbi, eat, eat. By his example, Jesus shows us that the kingdom of God shall have priority over all bodily comforts. Hmm. By his example, Jesus shows us that the kingdom of God shall have priority over all bodily comforts. Comforts. Now, put that quote with that verse, this passage, against your calendar and day timer and pray over it. Some of you are saying, well, wasn't Jesus' mission totally unique? I mean, there is only one Son of God, the Son of God. Jesus came, truly God, who became truly man, and he came as the Lamb of God. 
His mission, different than ours, was to lay his life down as a substitute for sinners on the cross. This is why John the Baptist points to Jesus and said, Behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Though the, sinner, though the Savior's mission is in some ways totally unique, as followers of Christ, our cause is united with his. Jesus lived every moment of every day with a single focus. What is the heartbeat of Lake Country Bible Church? To make mature disciples. What was the, the single-minded focus of Jesus? To make mature disciples. We might paraphrase John 4.34 for us as this. Our food is to do the will of him who saved us and to strive each day to accomplish his work. Here we have the spirit-filled Messiah, a man on a mission, driven to do what God called him to do, even when he is tired and hungry. Jesus understood that his life priorities were determined for him by God. We hear all this stuff about independence and I'm the captain of my own ship and I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. This is the opposite of the way of the master, the way of the cross, the way of Jesus. Jesus understood his life priorities. Do we understand ours? Jesus, listen, he never used busyness as an excuse for ministry negligence. This isn't to suggest that there's never a time or a place to rest. Obviously, the Lord ordained a day, a Sabbath day, one of seven to be set aside to rest, to worship, to fellowship, etc. But still, in this moment, the disciples are thinking about, hey, you're hungry, you need to eat. I don't know why you're talking even to this, this lady, but and Jesus says, guys, I can't even think about food right now. I can't even think about food right now. You know when Handel was writing the Messiah? He had a butler bringing him food every day. He was so consumed with the glory of God, this exalted vision of, of Christ and his grandeur. He kept bringing the food to his door. It kept coming back, kept coming back, kept coming back. Jonathan Edwards, the same way. His wife would bring him food. He'd be studying the word of God, just basking in the light of the glory of God's revelation. She'd bring food to be on eaten. He just was consumed with the glory of God, consumed. Here's Jesus consumed with the will of God, the priorities of, of God. There's a third excuse for evangelistic negligence illustrated in verse 35. Let's call this the procrastinator's I'll do it later mindset. And no, I'm not going to be talking about homework. Let's call this the procrastinator's I'll do it later mindset. Well, why bother? Jesus, Eat. Come on, we need to get out of our way. We got to get out of here. Now we have, eh. Ministry can wait. Verse 35. Do you not say, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? And very good chance that this was, was they looked around at the geographical setting, real people, real conversation, real history. They looked at the harvest. And, it's not harvest time yet. Isn't that what you say? Well, we got time. We got time. Behold, I say to you, verse 35, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes, friends. And look on the fields that they are white for harvest. When God provides you with an opportunity, take it. Seize the day. Don't delay. Today, if you hear his voice, is the hour of salvation. Spurgeon put it like this, all feeding, Christians who just like to hear sermons and study the Bible, all feeding and no working gives believers spiritual indigestion. Be idle, careless, 
with nothing to live for, no sinner to pray for, no backslider to lead back to the cross, no lost friend to point to Jesus, no young convert to pour into, and you'll find yourself having a serious case of indigestion. Some of us just need to get back in the game. Oh, I, I need to be better trained. Oh, you know, it wasn't quite the right time. I needed to be somewhere. And, you know, if I open up that gospel, crack that gospel nut, you know, I don't know where it might lead. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 tells us that we need to make the most of our time because life is short, eternity is forever, and the days are evil. No, don't wait. Lift up your eyes. See the opportunities that are all around you. As I said, we don't need to be praying for more opportunities. We need to be praying for eyes to see the opportunities that God has afforded us with and for courage and grace to take them. We move on now to a second heading. We've looked at the excuses. Now let's look at the believer's mission. Jesus has more to say about mission. One of the first things that, you know, an organization and a local church typically writes so that they're not aiming at nothing, hitting it every time, is a mission statement. Is your life on point? Is our church on mission? The ultimate mission is described in verses 35 to 38. It's connected to evangelism and to the big reveal that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Let's just do A, B, C, letter A. Notice that Jesus wants his disciples to understand this. Our mission is urgent. Do not... Do you not say there are yet, yet four months? That's conventional thinking. And then comes the harvest. Oh, friends, you need, to see, you need to see the world, the country, the news through the lenses of, 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 of Christ. Just look around you when you leave this place on the fields that are white for harvest. Guys, <laughs> the grain is ripe for the picking. Everything that the Lord has ordained and allowed in 2020, carrying over and bleeding over into 2021, people are afraid. People are thinking about death more than ever before. People are thinking about the purpose of life. What really matters what an opportunity. It's likely here, as, as Jesus said this, remember that, that the Samaritan woman basically left when the disciples come. She tells them, listen, you got to come see Jesus. You need to hear Jesus. See for yourself. I found the Messiah. He's here. The search is over. And they listened to her. And the Spirit worked in their heart through this lady And likely what Jesus is saying here, you have this proverbial, beautiful illustration, not only of the the harvest, but he's obviously talking about a spiritual harvest. He's talking about souls. And what would people wear back then? Middle Eastern men would wear white robes. Very likely, as Jesus is saying this, there were people coming. The crowds were beginning to gather around Jesus. Lift up your eyes. Friend, look around you. The spiritual harvest. That's why we sang this morning that wonderful hymn, Macedonia. You may not like the tune. All of us should treasure the lyrics. The song says this. It's a wonderful missionary gospel evangelistic outreach song. The vision of a dying world is vast before our eyes. We feel the heartbeat of its need. We hear its feeble cries. Lord Jesus Christ, revive your church in this, her crucial hour. Lord Jesus Christ, awake your church with spirit-given power. We all know what the Great Commission is. We sometimes forget that it's urgent. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to anyone. 
There's a second subpoint embedded within verses 36 and 37. This is all about our mission. The believer's mission. Let's call this letter B. You say this has been a, a you know a convicting sermon. Is there any encouragement in the text? Conviction is a blessing because it brings about repentance, which brings about change, which brings about greater obedience, which brings about greater blessing from the Lord. Let's call this, our mission is great, but Jesus wants us to understand this. The rewards are far greater. I understand this is a daunting task, even 2,000 years removed from the, the first missionaries of the church. Friend, the mission is great, but the rewards are far greater. Verse 36, 37. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal. You like that sound? Money, spiritual riches, wages, God giving, granting spiritual fruit. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal that he who sows and he who reaps may do what? You want to know greater joy? Greater love, greater obedience equals greater joy. He who reaps is receiving wages, gathering fruit for life eternal, bringing, as it were, the spiritual harvest into the bin before it's too late and judgment comes, that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together, for in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. This is just like our God, who is love. His bountiful benevolence, his magnanimous mercies. The Father blesses his workers with generous wages, lasting fruit, and shared joy. In other words, what we do in God's vineyard echoes, echoes, echoes in eternity. The mission is great. The mission is urgent, but the rewards are far greater. Nobody's going to wake up on heaven's celestial soil looking back and saying, that was a waste. Wish I would have spent less time at church, less time out trying to make mature disciples of my family and friends and neighbors and classmates. You want to experience the heights of joy? Do the work of evangelism. Talk to, talk to, to those who have reaped the fruit of their labors. There is no greater joy than to see someone come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's why we love baptisms at Lake Country Bible Church. Look at what God has done and is doing today as he fulfills his promise to build his church. There is no greater joy. Think about this passage in its context. There is no greater joy than to help someone go from being God's enemy to a true worshiper Paul, a terrorist against Christ and the church, transformed into a, one of the leaders of the church. <laughs> this brings us to letter C. Let me just make it very, very simple. Our mission then should we choose to accept, is to simply do our part as a good and faithful servant. Everybody here who's in Christ, has the Holy Spirit, knows the gospel. I know you know the gospel because you believe it, because that was the power of God unto salvation. Share what you know. Table what you don't. Point sinners to Christ. Go into the world and preach the gospel. Those who respond, join the local church, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to observe all that I commanded you. 
And remember this, Jesus will be with you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Here it is. Our mission is to simply do our part as a good and faithful servant. Verse 37, for in this case, the saying is true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. While you've been off, you know, getting physical food, I've been here eating spiritual food, doing the will of my father, reaching out to this Samaritan, this harlot, offering her living water. The Holy Spirit breathed life into her soul. She responds. She's now a convert. She's in the witness. This prostitute now, this prostitute-like lady is now in town telling people about Jesus. They then come, hear about Jesus. Many respond and are saved. In view of what we have seen here this morning, it is, basically comes back to this. Let us go, say, and do wherever, whenever, and whatever Christ asks of us. Let us go, say, and do wherever, whenever, and whatever Christ asks of us. In other words, let us faithfully sow the seed of the gospel. Verse 37, some sow. Others spend time then in the process of more time making mature disciples. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 7, and 8, some sow, some water. All of us ought to pray, Colossians 4. Just do your part. The two teams playing in the Super Bowl today, as they say, it takes three phases to win a game. Offense, defense, special teams. You're only one injury away from being in the game. Be ready. Just do your part. That's what the coaches always say. It's not, just do your part. Go where God calls you to go. Say what God calls you to say. Do what God calls you to do. Share what God calls you to share. Verse 39. This is the the wonder of God's plan. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in Jesus because of the word of the woman who testified. Huh. She didn't know much. She just told them what she knew. He told me all the things I've done. He showed himself to be a a prophet. I found out he's more than a prophet. He's the prophet. He's the Messiah. The search is over. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. The disciples said, hey, we want to get out of here as quick as we can. Jesus said, no, God has a different plan. So get out your tents. We're going to stay a few days because there's a harvest here. And so Jesus stayed there in enemy territory for two days. And guess what happened? Just simple, straightforward faithfulness. Here's what happened. Rejoice. You'll see these people one day in heaven. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, and it's no longer because of what you said that we believe or we've heard for ourselves and know that this one, speaking of Jesus, is indeed the savior of the world. So now what? Let's put away all of the excuses and get to work. Father, we thank you. for showing us the way and for instructing our hearts through the perfect example of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the evangelist par excellence, your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. We know the way. You've shown us the way. Now by faith help us to go and to speak and to love. Forgive me for the many excuses I've been making and grant a heart of compassion Lord, as we spend much time with Jesus, may we become more like him. 
the friend of sinners. Not only the king of Israel, but the savior of the world. Christ, you are our hope in life and death. Lord, may we experience greater joy in this year than any prior as we just simply seek to be faithful to the things that you've called us to be faithful in. We pray all this that you might be glorified, that many idolaters, adulterers, self-righteous, religious unbelievers, that they might come to know the joy of salvation, that we might have this shared joy in Jesus, who is our life. Amen.